and I had over like 2,000 heads with me. Oh. <laughs> They're like, we gotta inspect this. I'm like, oh no. They went through everything to make sure like there's nothing being smuggled and the CITES permit was the species they said it was or was no Do you feel any guilt sometimes when you know that an animal has been taken from its home? Oh, definitely. And that's why I am where I am with my collection in terms of care. It wasn't even so much I wanted to import to import or for money or whatever. I just, and to this day, actually, I just, I import to bring diversity. Welcome to episode number 80 of the Animals at Home podcast. My name is Dylan Perrin. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you're looking for more information on the podcast, make sure you head to animalsathomenetwork.com. There you will find show notes for all of the episodes that have been produced. If you've been following along with the YouTube channel or any of the social media posts, or even the bonus episode of the podcast that I released earlier this week, you know that I have officially launched my Patreon page. So if you are interested in learning more information about that, you can watch the previous bonus episode of this podcast, either on any podcasting app or on YouTube, or visit patreon.com slash animals at home. And there you'll find all the different tiers and what you get with each tier. A bunch of you guys have already signed up to be patrons, so thank you so much. That really does go a long way to help supporting the show. And if you're looking for other ways to support the show, you can rate the podcast on the Apple Podcasting app. Of course, a five-star rating is greatly appreciated. Or you can just share the content. Sharing is probably the simplest and easiest way to help grow the show. Thank you very much to CustomReptileHabitats.com for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. You can find affiliate links in both the YouTube description box as well as the show notes over at AnimalsAtHomeNetwork.com. Joining me on the podcast today is Ashley Dezan. Ashley is the owner and founder of Northern Lights Reptile Imports. I would say one of the more controversial areas in the reptile trade or reptile hobby is importing and exporting reptiles. We know there is tons of bad history in this domain. There's been horrible importers that have been importing wild caught animals en masse that shouldn't be imported and you know breaking rules and smuggling animals in and whatnot. So in general, this is an area of the hobby that already has some perpetual controversy linked to it. Now, fortunately, Ashley is a very conscientious importer. She has the animal's best interest at heart. She concerns herself with species diversity in the hobby, which is something that we talk about all the time. She is very eager to make sure we're adding new species to the hobby. And if there is any wild caught importation happening, that they're going to homes and breeders that are going to help establish captive populations in the hobby. And she also has an incredibly high standard of care when it comes to her own personal collection. And it's kind of an interesting story for how and why she does that. So in this episode, of course, we discuss how Ashley got into importing. It's a really fascinating story. We talk about the day-to-day -day of importing reptiles. What is that like? What is CITES? How does CITES impact the reptile trade? What are the things that she has to do to make sure she's complying with CITES regulations? Of course, we discuss wild caught. When is it okay? When is it not okay? And we wrap up the conversation discussing her collection, what animals she's working with, and hoping to establish in captivity in the next couple of years. Please enjoy my conversation with Ashley. Well, Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, no problem. Thank you as well. I'm looking forward to having this chat. I know that I try to have people from different areas of the hobby and you are you fulfill an area that is interesting and I have yet to cover, so I'm excited to talk about that with you. But tell me a little bit about yourself. How did you get into keeping in the first place? Well, I think as most little kids, dinosaurs. Um, Classic. I, yeah, I had a crazy fascination for it and for me it was actually learning the Latin names of dinosaurs. Go figure. You know, I'm all Latin name. I'm common name stupid. Uh, like when you that. were a kid, you were learning the Latin names of the dinosaurs? Oh, that's all I cared about. Yeah. That's, that's why I was awesome. like, what's the Latin name for this one? <laughs> and just always. And I always had like these like different puzzles and games just to learn all the different Latin names and from where. And I can't remember anymore, but that was my huge fascination. But I remember trying to catch frogs, but frogs scared the heck out of me too. And I was just <laughs> falling in the water screaming because I was like, I don't know, five years old, but I really wanted to touch them. And yeah, my first reptile interaction was one of those school educational programs and it was with the Burmese python. And mm -hmm. from there, I was just hooked. So what do you think, why? Because it's very unusual for someone to be obsessed with Latin names as a kid. Where did that come from? I have no idea, honestly. It was just... I thought it was so cool to learn these complex names because it's not normal, right? It's very yeah. different for most people. And like my mom would always like try and show me off to her friends. Like she can say these names. I'm just like, no. <laughs> I'm so horrible with Latin names. So I'm going to use you as a resource because I, I am a terrible reader and I can't 
you know, if you if you if you only read a Latin name, there's almost no chance of me pronouncing it properly because you're just sort of guessing. It's so I might really have to use hard. you. Yeah, like even sometimes I'm just like, guess this is how you say it. Go with it. <laughs> but once you get used to the rhythm of them, you kind of figure it out. And it's it's funny because when I was a kid, I remember m- my mom spent tons of time teaching my brother and I the names of the dinosaurs, but just the common names, like not necessarily the Latin names, although I guess a lot of them are Latin names now that I think about it. But then that movie Land Before Time came out and, you know, it's long necks and sharp tooth. And like within a weekend, all of our knowledge was erased and we're just calling them long necks and sharp tooth. My mom was so mad. So you were probably not that kid then. I'm sure you weren't calling them long necks. (laughs) Oh no, I get mad at people that did that. (laughs) that's awesome so how did this so what, what, what did you start keeping originally so you saw the burmese python and you got kind of interested and then where did the actual keeping journey start hmm. well for the longest time i couldn't keep reptiles as pets um so i would just every summer i'd go out collect tadpoles raise them release them and then throughout the years I'd actually have a book with me like I don't know I was like 11 12 years old doing this I'd have a book where I would have like a silhouette of a frog or an outline I mean and I would mark all the patterns unique patterns of each frog I found and then year after year see if I keep finding it and how many times I saw it it was was the same individual yeah just to see if I could find them all the time and there was this one particular one that was like a paradox uh exanthic green frog so he had like blue patches all over him it was really cool and I just watched them and document how they work so I lived on a farm so I could just come and go whatever and check them out um snakes I wasn't allowed to keep so I was just basically anytime I found them I just mess around with them for a bit and uh yeah I did that for a while my first snake I actually officially kept was a ball python mm-hmm. um that was in the states with my mom at the time and being I only go visit her it wasn't really like a full-time pet so she would take care of it and that's the only time i ever saw it and then when i was in canada um i ended up getting a boa and so that was like moved around with me everywhere because i lived in quebec at the time and i was just kind of going like here there and everywhere and so went from boa to immediately into the obscure stuff like i didn't even have snakes full time for a year and i was getting asian vine snakes and weird cryptic agamas and I just kind of spiraled from there. Interesting. So did you grow up in Canada or did you do some of your growing up in the States as well? It's, I was actually born in Quebec. Okay. Uh, and when I was three years old, I moved to the States with my mom. And then when I was 11, 12, I moved back to Canada. Gotcha. Interesting. So um, oh, what was I going to say about the, cause, oh yeah, yeah. So af- after you finished high school, did you want to pursue an education in animals or were you just, what you were doing at that time, you were, because it's weird being drawn to this, for one, the Latin names and then the unusual animals. Did you ever have a passion or a, a want to do that as an education? Actually, education-wise, no. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't want to even think about doing anything educational, whether it's me teaching or me going to school. I just thought, no, it's not something I want to do. Oddly enough, what drove me to do what I do now, I was still in high school or I just finished and I had an absurd fascination with mangrove snakes. Like I had cutouts put all over my wall. I'm just like, how am I going to get this? And one day I had a fortune cookie. This is so cheesy. And it said something along the lines of, if you try hard enough, you'll get what you want kind of thing. So I taped it underneath the mangrove snake. And I'm like, one day it'll happen. And within, I don't know, six months, someone randomly offered me one. And I was only 16 at the time. (laughs) They thought I was older because I kept a bunch of rear fanged already and I was kind of underage per se for a rear fanged, but they sold it to me and then I got three more after that. And then from there, just I needed to find more obscure stuff. I was like, why are they not in the hobby? And that's how I just kind of wanted to figure out how to do importing without even knowing it was a thing at mm-hmm. the time. That is really interesting. It's funny, like, you know, setting goals and having these you know something that you're pursuing is something that i'm used to being in the sports world and what you're saying there like having something pasted on your wall with a goal working towards i don't think very many people probably do that in the reptile world but it's certainly something that's all over like in the business world especially in in the sports world as well and obviously it it paid off you had a a dream to accomplish that so that is kind of crazy it's a really interesting story so 
then how did you start the importing? And because at that time, obviously, you were buying some obscure animals. Somebody was doing some importing. I'm sure you were buying from an importer of some sort. Um, it was actually just like friends of friends that knew stuff. And it was just like one of those, you don't know who the actual seller is because they were like quiet. And I, I didn't know back then. I was just, okay, I'm buying this. Yeah. But importing wise, like when I first started, um, it goes back to another mangrove snake, go figure. It was the, uh, the Filipino mangroves, the divergence. They had like nice bright blues on them. Yeah. And I was like, I need this in my life. I don't care how I'm going to find it. Or is it even in the hobby? I had no idea. So, oh, I don't even know how it really started. But I started going through different groups, websites. And I was like, hours of hours of research. And like, where are these? And being they were so obscure and unknown, there wasn't much information out there. And I happened to come across one female, a big adult female uh, her origins, I don't know if she was captured, bred, wild caught, no clue. And she was in Germany. And I was like, hmm, interesting. And at the time, I was like, oh, gosh, almost $2,000 for this one snake. And I was like, whatever, buy it. And oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to get it here. I had no idea. Just that is like, an extreme purchase, too. Like, $2,000 is not a small amount of money to just, but I'm guessing you wanted it so bad that. It's funny yeah. how the number that you're willing to spend on a snake just slowly increases. Like first you're just like, oh, 200 seems a lot. And then you can justify 800 and then it just goes forever. Exactly. And like I did, it was a payment plan situation, like short, very short term. And, but I had no idea how to get it to me. And I was like, oh my God. So I went through a bunch of like websites trying to figure out if there are any importers into uh, Canada or anywhere, just imports in general in Europe. And I don't know anybody in Europe at the time. So is this guy a scammer or is, are they gonna rip me off? I had no idea, but I just blindly did it, found someone that was willing to import them in. And so I just got a very small little order together with a couple friends of some species they wanted as well, just to make it a little bit more worthwhile and then imported them in with, oh, if two more divergents I found after that too. The that came in on the same package? Yeah, the first captive bred babies that were ever done through a, it was a Russia zoo. And so I bought two of those. So I had three come to me and that one shipment. And then it just kind of spiraled from there. How much were the babies? They were more. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a small purchase. No, it took about a year to really get everything going in together. I was, I was so surprised the guy was that patient, honestly. But, uh, yeah, you'd think someone might have scooped them out who was, you know, someone on that side of the world. Well, exactly. That's, I, was, I just remember being so excited to the point, like, I almost had that surreal, like, high feeling when you're really excited about something. It's like, yeah. oh, my God, this is actually happening. And, yeah, that's what got me importing. So tell me about the moment you opened that package then. Oh, God, it was awesome. It was so awesome. I was so scared they're going to be dead or something. Oh, yeah, I bet. But yeah, they were amazing shape. They were perfect and I grew them up and I produced the first ones in North America at that point. And uh, it was awesome. So you used one of the neonates that you bought and paired it with the adult female that you bought as well? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yep. That's, that's, so how, how many years ago was that? Oh, gosh. I first started, believe it or not, that's like maybe only six years ago. Okay. Well, yeah. a lot can happen in six years, especially if you're like that focused on something and, and you want to go. So that was your first experience importing. Was there any red tape you had to go through at that time? Or was it just that you had an importer and that paperwork was done on their side? Um, well, I still had to get my import number and the whole nine. And I had no idea what I was doing. I somehow managed to figure it out properly. But uh, yeah, it was pretty smooth sailing considering I had no idea what I was doing. So then... What happened next? So that you've you've successfully imported your first box of reptiles, almost just more of on a personal level. But then I guess what made you think maybe I should do this for a living? Well, at the time in the whole reptile industry, from what I saw anyway, it was a lot of like leopard geckos, crested geckos, ball pythons, corn snakes, you know, the common stuff. You don't really see many obscure species. Like you'd see the odd like wild caught table at the expo. But it was still very common stuff like rough green snakes or red-headed agamas, stuff like that. And I knew there was so much more out in the world. And it's like, why do we not have this? And 
it wasn't even so much I wanted to import to import or for money or whatever. I just, and to this day, actually, I just, I import to bring diversity, whether it's the same species for bloodline or new species in general, it's, Canada needs diversity. Um, really North America as a whole, there's, there's too much of the same going over and inbreeding. And that's just, I guess that's a, a moral side of me where it's like, there should be more diversity here and people should learn and experience newer species, not just the same old whatever, because that's how we learn, right? Mm-hmm. I totally agree. I think it's one of the downfalls of where we are currently in the hobby is the fact that a few species have exploded in popularity and they are good beginner species. And some people don't like that term, but I think, you know, a ball python is a pretty good beginner species as far as like the ruggedness of it. But I totally agree. I, I, it's, it's frustrating when I see someone with 200 ball pythons when you, and and I get why they do that. It's sort of a different game, but at the same time, how cool would it be to have many different species from different parts of the world and, and sort of really highlight the incredible animals that are reptiles not just the same species over and over again exactly and I, honestly i only keep obscure species for the most part now and the things i learn on a daily basis just by observing them it's it's amazing things i never know i learn and experience like 10 years ago well and i guess probably a lot of this we'll, we'll get into more detail about the species you keep later but probably a lot of the species you do keep is you have to learn on the fly because there's no there's going to be very few people who are currently caring for them and, and can offer you husbandry advice. Oh, exactly. And at least with, as I'm learning that, then I could start telling other people like, Hey, this is a good way to go about things. And then they could start learning with the, the species they have or whatever it may be really. So as far as how the importing business is now, can you kind of just describe a little bit about your day to day, sort of how, what, it, how it works now that you've kind of evolved from that original package what were the next steps? You just started offering, looking for animals for people or would people come to you and ask, hey, can you find this for me? Or how, how does it work? So when it very first started, people be like, hey, keep an eye out for this or I want this species or if I found something like, oh, this person might like that and I'd let them know. It's just like casually like that. It'd be just like one little box coming in. And it's just things that people ask me to keep an eye out for, for the most part. Um, and that's really when I started getting to know people in Europe too and developing like friendships and trusts and it's all the the whole nine there um but for the most part at the beginning it was people asking me and then over time now it's I get offered stuff to sellers I mean from sellers sorry and then I still have people asking me for specific species as well so it's kind of a mix of both now um a lot of the sellers in Europe they don't even bother offering in Europe anymore. They're like, hey, can you put my list up? Can you sell these, please? And sure, why not? So it's a 50-50 if I do for them or not, but at least they can move whatever they have to move. Diversity comes in. It's kind of a win-win for everybody there. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah, it's It definitely seems like an intimidating field to step into because there's so many moving parts. How, how do you, I guess now you're saying you you have contacts in, in Europe and, and whatnot makes, makes it a lot easier, but I'm sure when it first started, you were probably almost gambling in some sense, like hoping that the animals that you were getting sent were the right animals. Yeah, exactly. There's, there are a few times where people would send me something else or not at all, but it's very minimal compared to the people that were honest and trustworthy. So Mm. I consider that a win. Like maybe one out of every 50 people would be an issue. Did it take long? Cause is it your full-time job? Is that all you do right now? Or are you working somewhere else? It is all I do. How long did it take to go from that first box to a full time? Um, I quit my last job about a year and a half ago. And oh, okay. that's when I realized I can't do this because like I could still do a, f- a full time job because it's not like I work 10 hours a day doing the import stuff. The problem came is with the time differences. So right. when I'm working, your people are contacting me and I can't con like I can't obviously be on my phone all day doing business and and realize this is a problem. So I just took the gamble, I quit. And since then it's been doing really good. So Yeah, interesting. Can you talk a little bit about CITES in general? Because it's one of the words that gets thrown around a lot. I think some people are very aware of it. Some people kind of say it, I think, without realizing what the legislation means. So maybe you can talk a little bit about about it and then how that, what you have to do to make sure you're following the rules of CITES. So CITES, uh, 
I'll just put it in a simple perspective. It's basically controlling the international trade for endangered species. That's not what it stands for, but it's the same it's concept of that. Um, it's weird because like ball pythons are CITES, but mm -hmm. they're not endangered, right? So all boas and pythons are just like blanket, not banned, but they're for permit bases. They all need a permit. And why that is, I really don't know. I never really looked into it, but it's mainly there to protect species that are vulnerable, endangered, or maybe with ball pythons in this case, they have a high collection rate. Mm -hmm. So especially like with the whole morph side of everything, they always want to bring in new ones for potential new morphs, right? And I'm not sure if this is the reason why they're on CITES, but my guess is to help kind of control that a little bit more. And so they're just not like brought in by the hundreds of thousands all at once. Right. Um, it's not impossible to get CITES species. You just have to go through a permit process, have a proof of origin. So like with a breeder in Europe, like oh, every country is different. I should say that first. And with Europe, it's a little extra complicated because they have to be registered with the government with their animals, whether it's a ball python boa, could be something super cryptic like, I don't know, Fiji iguanas or something. But they all have to be registered. And if they're not registered, you basically can't bring them in. And um, you just need proof of origin, um, all the animals history info, like parents, grandparents, if you can. But with that, you can get permits, bring them in. Um, depending on what country I'm sending to, you need import and export permits. Mm -hmm. But it's in the end, it's really not hard to do with CITES. It's just, it's timely, it's costly. It's really in place to protect the species in the end. And every year you get a couple new ones added on. And they're usually a species that are, they're not supposed to get exported to other country, like Sri Lanka was the most recent mm -hmm. one. Right. And because they're they were non cites for a long time. I guess there was like poachers going there, you know, just freely grabbing them and they could spread across the globe, which is not an amazing situation, obviously. So everything from there just went right onto CITES one, which there's actually I should mention that actually. There's three appendixes or appendices. And there's one, two, and three. So CITES one are the critically endangered ones where it's extremely hard to get a permit. So Fiji iguanas are on that one. Um, rhinoceros iguanas are on that one. Not a whole lot, but there's a few. The dumeril, dumeril boas, believe it or not, are CITES one. Technically, every single dumerals we have in Canada should have a permit with them at all times. That's not the case, but they really should because they're, they're on CITES one. Um, so if like a CITES conservation officer really, really wanted to, they could be like, hey, show me the permit, otherwise we're taking your BOA. That happening is extremely unlikely, probably next to zero, but it's just one of those things It's always good to have proof of origin because they're considered endangered. If somebody had a Dumeril's BOA right now, would it even be possible for them to get a CITES certificate? Because who knows where they, yeah, it'd be impossible, right? <laughs> no, yeah, you can't, there's no way to import export them. Um, especially there's no proof of origin, no nothing anywhere on them, mm -hmm. unless they get traced back to the very first import, a legal right. import that is. Maybe Which would be basically impossible. impossible. Exactly. Um, funny enough, the U.S. does not allow import of CITES 1, period, or export for some reason. Canada allows it, Europe allows it, as long as you have an import permit and they inspect your house, make sure you have a proper enclosure for it, and you're not allowed to sell them until I think they're first or second generation within your household. Mm. So it's it's an interesting system, I guess, in that case. And then you have CITES 2, which is the most common uh, tier, which is a lot of the bo uh, boas and pythons. So basic Colombian boas, ball pythons. Um, there's a few colubrids on there. All, majority of the monitor lizards are on CITES 2 just because they are highly sought after, they're taking all the wild heavily, doesn't necessarily mean they're endangered though. It's just to kind of help control what comes in and out and they know how many is going out. So they know like, oh, this year we need a quota on this species because there's too many going out. So they'll tell the whatever country they're coming from, stop importing these or exporting these for this year. And then maybe next year they'll resume. And then you have CITES 3, which is a, it's a strange one. It goes usually by locality. So like, let's say there is a species in India 
India does not allow export. So there is this one particular species there that's kind of vulnerable, not quite endangered, but they're vulnerable. So let's say a Russell's viper, I'll use that as an example. They're a non cites species, but specifically from India, they are CITES because they're vulnerable there. So if you're on the website and it'll, you'll see, it says the Boya Russelli, and it says India in brackets. So specifically that locality has to have a permit with it. It's weird. It's all very strange, but it just comes down to their vulnerable state. Right. Interesting. So, and, and I guess that's where some of the gray area comes in, right? Like if you're dealing with a specific locality, without a doubt, things slip through the cracks illegally all the time. And we do see that. So it's, it's no surprise that that happens. Is, do you think CITES is, a f- is there too many loopholes where people can sneak through things or, or is there anything they could do better or what happens there? Um, I think it depends on the scenario because there's some species that might look freakishly similar. Like if we have the... Um, Trying to think of the common name. It's pretty bad. <laughs> the lion is Pataeus mucosa. Um, basically, it's an Indian killed rat snake. Mm. I think that's the common name. But of that entire genus, that's the only one that's on CITES too. Where you have Pataeus coros from Indonesia, which is non CITES, but they look near identical. So I wouldn't be surprised if people bring those in as Pataeus coros instead of mucosa to avoid the CITES situation. Um, that's, I don't encourage that. You always should have your permits with you. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that happens or there's a situation like false water cobras. For some reason, their genus is not updated on the CITES website. Mm. It's still under Cyclogross, where now it's Hydrodynasties. So if a customs officer doesn't know the difference, you import on the invoice as Hydrodynasties, so they won't know. Unless one day they randomly go through the list like, oh, this is a synonymous name to that. And then there's that issue. Right. So when you import something through CITES, what is the interaction with the government like? When you go pick up the package, is there an interaction there with the conservation officer or how does that work? Um, Anytime I do CITES, I try and make it sure it's a shipment specifically from one breeder just because it could get messy. And if I get inspected, like if I have a huge shipment, that's... I don't want them sitting around for eight hours, right? If I have like so many animals. So I try and keep that at a minimum. Um, Sometimes I get inspected. Sometimes I don't with CITES stuff. I'll have my permit with me. I hand it over. They just double check, make sure it's legit and not like a fake permit. And sometimes I'll Google and check if the breeder is real or whatever. And that's usually it. Um, For a while, Ottawa Council, Council, they have the CITES office there. Mm -hmm. They had every single per, um, shipment checked for some reason. Not just me, but like fish, everybody. They're trying to see how many study species come through. Right. And go figure. One of my biggest shipments happened during that time. It was, oh my gosh, I think it was like nine boxes. And I had over like 2,000 heads with me. Oh. <laughs> They're like, we got to inspect this. I'm like, oh no. <laughs> and it took them 10 hours. Really? Oh my gosh. Hours. They went through everything to make sure like there's nothing being smuggled and the studies permit was the species they said it was, or was no extras or whatever. Right. And yeah, that was rough because I got to the airport. Uh, I think it was around seven o'clock waited around till 2 AM gave up. And then they called at like, oh, it was like 10 AM or so. And they're like, you can come pick up now. I'm like, Oh God. Wow. Like, Right. <laughs> so how vulnerable are you in that situation? Like what if the person who sent you that package mislabels something or does something wrong? Are you li- like, what's the punishment if something goes haywire? I'm not sure. Honestly, I've never had that happen. Um, I've had stuff come unlabeled before and usually I get asked what it is and they'll like check it. But one time they're able to just check it. They just knew what it was themselves. And I had no idea what it even was. It was something Gecko, a customer ordered, and, and they said they showed it to me. Like this one was on labels. I'm like, I don't even know what that is because it was a gecko where the colors go really dark when they're stressed out. So I couldn't tell what it was. And they're like, we think it's this species, and go figure. This ended up what being what it was. Mm. So they know a lot more than people think they do. Yeah, yeah. I guess they are they are animal people as well, right? So they're trained in that. So how does this work? So when you bring home a, a shipment, 
how, how does your home set up? Like, obviously, you have your personal collection. I'm sure you try your best not to contaminate that with the imports. Do you have like a separate room where you bring in packages and do you have to set them up in a tub or something while you're waiting to sell them? I mean, most of the animals are already sold, right? But there's probably some limbo time. Well, and that's just it. Majority of the shipment is always pre-sold. Um, and so what happens, they come in, put them in the kitchen as soon as we walk in the house and the basement door is right there. So I have the basement set up for all the imports. Um, unfortunately, my shipments are always like seven o'clock. So I'm not home till 9 p.m. So I have to stay up all night, which is awesome. (laughs) I have some awesome help though now that like stay with me all night to set up. But uh, basically we unload all the sensitive stuff first, like whatever is like a cryptic species or if we're kind of like, ooh, it didn't take shipping too well, we deal with them right away. Go through everybody, deal with it and um, give everybody water. If somebody needs a good soak, we put them aside in a bin with water, let them soak for a little while. I check everybody over for mites too. So like I, I try to be a different importer in that sense. I try to keep the quality up there in terms of care. And if I see any problems, I let the buyer know right away. But uh, it usually takes an average shipment, let's say around 800 heads would be, I don't know, it takes around six and a half hours with three people. Yeah, wow. So. That yeah. is, yeah, that is a lot. And it's always happened because I actually have seen, I think Mike was helping out with his girlfriend yeah. and yeah, I, I saw them, he was posting some stories and there's just like boxes everywhere and it looks like a lot of work. Yeah, it is, but it's worth it in the end. Thankfully, a lot of the stuff are, like, are small, like baby house right. snakes or whatever. So like I do have bins for them. I wish I had an example. Actually, I do. So just for example, I use bins like this. Mm, yeah. Those are just like the clip on with the little gasket lid. Yeah. Yeah. And I have like a little screen here that'll regulate the humidity and airflow. But uh, with bins like that, I could do like arboreal setups or even terrestrial if needed. Um, but I have about one, two, seven racks downstairs, various different sizes for different snakes or geckos or something. But I also have seven large enclosures for the larger species or lizards. Actually, the same type of enclosures that are behind me. Hmm. And so I have a bunch of those and sometimes depending on the species, it might have to spill over into this room, but I only, only do that with lizards. I refuse to bring snakes in here cause you never know. Right. That's all. Right, I cause this is all snakes behind you. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So they, that's a no go. They don't come up here. Yeah. That's, that's probably good. So at, at any one time you must have, or like after a shipment, you have hundreds of animals. What, what's the requirement from you? Like how long does it take for you to move them to the customer? Is there like a week or so where you're feeding 800 animals? Uh, it depends. A lot of people are pickup uh, customers. Mm, so they okay. come the next day, grab what they ordered. So I don't have to really worry too much about those guys. Like I'll just give them some water, hydrate them, and then they get picked up. Um, when it comes to shipping animals, it depends on the day they arrive. So if they're in good stance, like good health, they'll go out the next day if it's a shipping day. If I'm a little unsure about it, I tell a customer, hey, it's going to stay here for the weekend. I want to make sure it's good and hydrated before sending it out. And then I have a lot of orders for the states. So those ones I have to hold for a week, two weeks, three weeks, depending however okay. long. Important date is for the states. And actually 60% of my shipment is usually U.S. Really? Wow. It's a lot of babysitting. And it's kind of, it's exhausting. Honestly, there's some days I'm like, why do I have my own reptiles? <laughs> yeah, you're just caring for everybody else's. Yeah, and it's just, it's exhausting, honestly. But they usually no issues. Oh, very minimal issues. Like sometimes they'll come in a little too weak and they get extra TLC. And sometimes you might, you know, they might not make it. But that's very rare to have that happen. So you don't have to go into too much detail here, but I'm curious about how you, the sort of fee structure works. Do people pay you like an import fee or do you just pay a, do they pay an extra percentage on the percent? total of the animal or how, how do you make money so it's mostly on the the import fees so i okay. have a structure like one to one head is i don't know off the top of my head 125 dollars two is 200 three is whatever four plus gotcha. right um but i will work around it a little bit like if someone wants to import a bunch of baby garter snakes i'm not going to charge them 65 dollars each no way they're so tiny right i don't (laughs) don't feel right doing that so i'll 
drop it down to like 40 bucks or something. And gotcha. there's the 5% customs fee that everyone has to pay because I have to pay that upon import. Right. So it's whatever the value of the animal is on the invoice, I have to pay that. And then if it's a CITES animal, is there an additional fee as well? Depending on the country they come from. Oh, Each okay. country is different. Like the Netherlands, I think it's free, whereas Germany is 80 euro or whatever. It's crazy. Yeah, it's a really crazy business. So it's, it seems like there's a ton of moving parts. So it's pretty cool. So as far as obviously a big part of importing from foreign countries deals with wild caught animals. So, so there's no question there. And, and for me personally, I'm okay with most wild caught animals. I shouldn't, no, sorry. Let me rephrase that. I'm not okay with most wild caught animals. I'm okay with wild caught animals as in general as a concept. I think as long as they're going to proper homes, it's good. I, I'm not I'm not a huge fan of, you know, Petco importing thousands of water, you know, Chinese water dragons that are going to shrivel up and die in their, in the little cubbies in their store. So there's definitely a line there. So what, what are your opinions on, on wild caught and how do we keep it on the ethical side? Uh, I'm actually the same stance as you in that mm -hmm. case. Um, me personally, I will avoid selling wild caught to some people. I feel just want it because they want it. And that might be a little wrong of me, but at the same time, it's like, how are you going to be with that? I don't know you. You only want one for some reason. Why not a pair? You know, if you mm -hmm. want to get them breeding, um, if it's the really, yeah, if you want to encourage the diversity of the hobby, you, selling a single wild caught animal to Joe Schmo who just wants it because it looks cool is totally pointless and it doesn't help us. Exactly. Unless it's to add like new bloodline for their own stuff. Okay. Right. But if you're not telling me that I might just kind of not talk to you about it kind of thing. Right. Um, but then it also comes to. I import a lot of wild caught for myself in a sense of feeders. Yeah, I do. A, all the feeders are mainly for myself, but then I will sell some too to encourage again the diversity of species within the within the Canadian hobby. In terms of if someone wants an Asian vine snake, they can now keep that. You know, right. if they're offered their natural prey item because rodents they don't eat rodents. <laughs> That's just what it comes down to. So when it comes to like Chinese water dragons or people just want it to resell or something, no way. I, I don't allow that unless it's only for bloodline. If you are serious about trying to establish a species, I kind of want to see how you're going to be keeping it. Yeah. If it's just going to be a wild caught, fresh wild caught thrown into a tub, nothing of it forever. Sorry, that's not happening because they should be treated as well as possible being they just got ripped out of the wild right exactly keep it happy the best you can as stress-free as possible honestly i might get flack for this the guys behind me like my machete snakes they went straight into these enclosures and they have like roughly an 80 to 90 percent death rate when they're imported which is really sad and that's they're my big focus now. I don't really want to keep much else down the road other than these guys because I want to get them established in captivity. I don't want to see them keep getting imported and dying just because people feel they have to throw it in a sterile bin or a sterile enclosure for a while or they try and feed it things it's not supposed to eat. So I'm just adamant on getting these guys set up for captivity so I could offer captive bread to people that really want them. How long have you had those guys in captivity? year and a half and okay they, so and they seem to be doing fine they're zipping around all over the place behind you yeah so and usually they've lasted maybe two months really so i consider that a win unfortunately my female is old as a fart cake <laughs> <laughs> so it's a little concerning in that case so i'm on the hunt now a few people are keeping their eye out for more for me trying to get more females in but they're all males so far I've never heard of a machete snake besides when you mentioned it last week on the other thing that we were doing. What 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 is that? So it's a South American colubrid. Um, unfortunately, they're big time frog eaters and only frog eaters. Mm -hmm. I've experimented before, and like I even skinned a rat to try and gain weight onto oh one. <laughs> yeah, it's gross. And then I scented it with a frog, and she ended up regurging it a few days later because she couldn't digest it. Like that's how sensitive they are. And it's like, they have to eat frogs or maybe a day old quill, which is very easy to digest. But um, I wonder if I could get one out and not get murdered. But um, they call them machete snake because they have very sharp teeth and they will rip you up pretty good. Have you been bitten by them? 
Not yet. Thank God. Oh, good. <laughs> not yet. My female, I will not take her out unless it's absolute mandatory, but she's like eight and a half feet long. So in her really? head, it's long. Oh, yeah. Wow. Because I see this little guy behind you, but maybe it's the camera's perspective. How, how small well, is the male? He's just, uh, he's not related to the machetes. I have oh, this okay. here is actually connected to this one. Gotcha. Okay. And so that one usually is in there, but I have them connected so the two big guys can move around back and forth. He's just a random little gecko controller because I have free range geckos in there. So yeah, that's just a bronze back. That's totally different. So is he in the same enclosure as the machete snakes? Oh, cool. And this, you have like some morning geckos or something that are just reproducing on their own and, and he exactly. goes and goes after them? Exactly. So it's a little cohab situation, but they all act very differently. Like one's always up and the others are always down. They're never meeting up with each other. So so as far as the imports for the feeders, is it mostly frogs or are you, you're, you have some lizards as well that come in, right? Yeah, I do uh, feeder geckos, like house geckos I bring in and uh, a variety of tree frogs. Do you think that, because, you know, if you take something like a, like a boa, for example, in the wild, their diet is like, 30 or 40 percent reptile mm -hmm. so they're eating lizards big lizards most likely yeah. do you think eh, this is kind of a sketchy area with the hobby because it, it's too close to home in a lot of ways even though we mm -hmm. kill and, eat, and you have the, the animals eat rats all the time and you know, yeah. people who keep rodents are offended by that but do you think it will, there'll be a point where we're importing larger reptile species for feeders it's crossed my mind a few times i'm not gonna lie yeah um, but the amount of people that will end up using it is another story. So I don't want to just blindly do that and have nothing to do with like, what do I do with it after? Right. I'm not just right. going to have them around, just have them around. Um, the boas I used to keep, they were actually mainly bird eaters on my end. Cause I didn't have lizards to feed, but mostly quail and chicken. I'd always be feeding them. Yeah kind of make up for that lack of reptilian diet. It was kind of almost similar, not quite. But um, anytime I can with any other species, they get geckos and frogs or whatever. Like my garters, 50% of their diet is frog. Right. Well, it's more natural and that's kind of what they're eating in the wild. And I guess when you import them, you're importing them live, right? Yes. Yeah. And then do you feed them live or do you, have, do you I guess that's one other questionable area. Yeah. I humanely put them down and then uh, put them in the freezer and I... What's, what's the word? I vacuum seal them just to preserve their whatever you want to call it, their their firmness or whatever. Because when you just throw them in a bag in a freezer, they turn into freezer burnt jerky like in a month. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, they have to get vacuum sealed. And then when you thaw them out, it's like almost like they're still alive. So Yeah, interesting. Wow. Well, so one other area that, you know, with importing – you know, with ham, for example, this giant expo in Germany, there's, we always hear about these sort of sketchy things happening there with mislabeling and, and, you know, wild caught animals. Like, like we said, we're not, not necessarily against wild caught animals, but when they're, when they're not labeled properly or we're not following the rules, it's, it's hard for us to justify because as a hobby, we've done our fair share of damaging wild populations, right? We just go in and, you know, poach them like crazy. It's not good. So is there any way to, like, how do you as an importer, protect yourself from importing animals that you're not intending to to import um there's really not much i can do about that because i don't right. know when i see them right mm. and thank gosh i've never had that happen <laughs> in that sense but if that ever happened there's a blacklist going up pretty freaking fast yeah. whether uh, it's the seller or on the customer's end whoever decided to do it then they're never doing them again and i'll make sure people know that too just because yeah. I don't support anything like that. And I, honestly, I wouldn't know what to do otherwise. I think that's the only way we can clean up those sections of the hobby. Because it, I, as I said, like with, with the wild caught and its populations coming in, it's nice because we can establish them. Like with the machete snakes, for example, we can establish a, um, a population in captivity. And like you said, if they're dying at 80 or 90%, it's just sad to be taking them out of the wild just to kill them basically. Yeah. And so we want to make sure that those are going to the right spots. But at the same time, like it's frustrating when you hear of poachers just going wild in the rainforest, bringing up animals when it doesn't help us at all. Yeah. Well, and that's just it. And I, I know I'm contributing to part of the problem <laughs> with the machetes being brought in more and more because I keep buying them. So they're like, Ooh, let's, uh, you know, catch more. And what, what if I'm not the one that gets the next one? Right. Mm, yeah. Oh, so, and 
I feel super bad about that. But yeah, I was going to ask, do you feel any guilt sometimes when you know that an animal has been taken from its home? Oh, definitely. And that's why I am where I am with my collection in terms of care is because I want to give them the best possible because I feel like a giant turd. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think you need to have that. Like it's, it's part of Im being an importer. Like you want the importer to say like, I feel bad about this in a way because you know that, that their heart is in the right spot. And I look behind you, you have all these amazing enclosures and you have a, a YouTube channel that there's a few videos on there as well. I was looking at, you have just amazing setups. So is that where most of that eagerness to set those enclosures up that way comes from yep believe it or not i guilt myself hard into making them better and i still do it like even to the, like every day i'm looking at them like what can i do better it doesn't look good enough what can i do but there's really not much more i can do in terms of unless i give them an entire room to themselves which i can't do that yet yeah. one day maybe but not yet how many animals do you have in your collection personally for yourself mm, myself Five, six, uh, roughly 20. Oh, okay. So that's a, that's actually a, a relatively small number compared to what I thought, because considering you have hundreds of animals moving through your home, there's probably a temptation to want to just add one to your collection when you see, see something on a list that you want. Definitely. There definitely is. Like I have more in here, but they're like long-term babysitting snakes that did come in an import, but they've passed the, they're clean. They're basically quarantined out from the basement. So I bring them up here to give them a bit of a better enclosure until it's time for them to go. Hmm. Has your care always been as high level as it is? Like you have live plants, you have all this crazy stuff behind you. It looks amazing. Did you start like those first reptiles that you started keeping? Was that always there? Uh, yes and no. Um, the very, very first one with the ball pythons with my mom, like they're part-time pets, but my stepdad built a huge four, I think it was like four feet by four feet by like three feet high enclosure for them. And uh, so I've always been used to large enclosures that way. Um, my first boa I got, she, she had a 40 gallon breeder right away, even as a baby. And I had branches and like bark you buy at the pet store and stuff like that. Um, there was a point where I started buying a lot of boas, like I was more in the boa scene at the time. And I would do a rack system with newspaper. Like I didn't see anything bad with it. And there really isn't necessarily anything really bad about it. It's not my thing. I don't really fully agree with it now. But back then, it was I, that's what I did as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it was always a mix of stuff. Like with my Amazon tree boas, my mock vipers, my mangrove snakes, they were always naturalistic to some extent. I wasn't doing bio or live plants, which is like a bunch of fake plants with sticks and dirt. But it's always been around for me. Not 100%, but always has been. And then I guess bringing in the wild caught animals put that into overdrive. Yeah, exactly. And now I just do it with everything. Even if I'm quarantining something, it's very basic. I use eco earth because it's easy to clean. And a couple fake plants, sticks, cork. And if I notice anything, then... I'll put them on paper or whatever, if it's like a mite treatment or whatever. It has to be for like a week or two. But other than that, it's still equal with cork. Best I can stimulate or simulate, sorry. So as far as the machete snakes go, you were saying there's such a high death rate and you just threw them basically right into these vivs. Yes. Why are they dying in captivity? Is it something to do with having, like, are they stressed out in the small sterile tub or is there a diet issue? Or like, why do you think having throwing them in the viv gave you success? There's a few factors to that. More often than not, they come in extremely dehydrated um, just because where they come from and then they go to the wholesaler or the farm and then the wholesaler and wholesalers will just toss them in a bin of newspaper because they're not going to be around doing what I do. So with that, they're getting more dehydrated because there's not enough humidity. They don't get fed because they're not going to be catching frogs for them and feeding them until they're sold, unfortunately. But so the way they come in, like my male, when I got him, a friend of mine took care of him the best she could. Like she had to force feed him with, with a syringe and had to actually do IV for water to get him hydrated. So when he came to me, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I just threw him straight into an enclosure. And maybe within two weeks, he plumped up beautiful. Like just because really? of the humidity in there. He just, he looks like a captive bred snake almost now. But I didn't see him for maybe a month. Like the odd peak, I would see him just, you know, to make sure he was alive. Food would disappear. Like I'd do like frog legs with uh, like calcium powder and stuff at the time. 
and he turned around really, really well, really fast. So and that, same thing with the female. She she was with my friend in the States for a while. Um, she did a similar setup as me in a, like a four by two. She did dirt and fake plants and whatever. And she did really good with her. But all the other ones I've ever seen, I've heard of, they were put into sterile quarantine first. They never make it out of there. It's just too much of a shock, I guess. Yeah. Well, going from a dense jungle to sterile. And yeah. they're very high strung already. So, and I think that's a huge contributing factor. They're just one of those snakes that should not be put into quarantine unless it's for a serious situation. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's very fascinating. So then what else do you have? You have the machete snakes, you have the little bronze back cruising around in there. And what are some of the other, you don't have to go through all 20, but. I have some red tail green rat snakes, uh, particularly this locality is from Borneo. So they're not your typical green ones. Like right now they're green. But when they're older, the female will be like a, a bronze lemon color. Really? With a tail and a, and a greenish head. And the male, he's already changing slowly. He's like a blackish blue color when he's older with a bronze head. Wow, that's super cool. I've never seen that. Yeah, I'll have to show you a picture later. It's really, really cool. Like right now, they're just green. Can't really see much of a difference. But every shed, there's a little something different going on. Um, I have Egyptian false cobras, which not a real cobra before anyone's like, Oh my God. <laughs> um, they're colubrid. They do hood up and stand like a cobra though. It's pretty cool. And they only get like two feet long. Oh wow! Uh, they're actually a strangely communal snake too. They always like to be around with each other. Um, uh, they're just, they're cool. They have like two strong UVBs on them, like 14%. And then they love hot spots of like 120, 130 degrees. Wow. That is crazy. They're always under it too. So I'm like, is it hot enough? Are you guys okay? <laughs> um, but other than that, I have, I have no more mangroves. So I stopped keeping those. How come you stopped keeping those? Because they're regularly captive bred now. And my focus is trying to get another species established into captivity and breeding. So they were just kind of, I don't want to say they were taking up space, but it wasn't necessary for me to keep them as much as I love them. It's just not necessary. Mm. Gotcha. I do have one species of boiga. I'll, uh, one second. They're pretty cool. These are some of the first ones into North America, let alone really within captivity. He's, he's a little guy. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's still young, but this comes from like Iran and Afghanistan area. I don't know what their common name is, honestly, but boiga trigonata is the, uh, the Latin name. These are some of the first ones ever released into captivity. This is a captive bred guy. And uh, most animals of this genus are highly tropical, but this comes from the harshest deserts. It's the weirdest thing. Wow, I've never, yeah, I never heard of that species. So obviously that's a rear fang as well in the Boega, yeah. So was that captive bred in Europe? Uh, yeah, from Russia actually. Oh, from Russia. Yeah, so I work with some uh, people over there from Tula Zoo, and the one guy captain bred these guys. So they're really, really cool. They Still have really such cool. huge eyes. Yeah, they're really cool. But uh, yeah, they uh, they always have my heart. So I have to have one species, and I figure, you know what? These guys need it. They need some more captive breeding. So so you'll work with them to start producing some captive bred ones in, uh, of your own. Yeah, exactly. So here's hoping they stay small too, like. Not this small, but like two, three feet, maybe a little and bit. Then, I guess, how many do you have right now? Of these? Yeah. Uh, just a pair. Oh, just a pair. And they're from the same clutch. So w will you try to import new blood for that species if you're going to work with them? Yeah. Or? So there was an unfortunate situation with that. Um, the seller actually lost his only male he had. Oh. So I was like, oh, God, so I only have two related ones, but he's trying to source more to bring the to the zoo which so the one bonus when it comes to zoos they're legally obtained and exported out so once they hit a zoo you could even if it's some weird species that's not allowed to be exported i'll say borneo or in this case iran the zoos get them legally and with that in europe and russia they're allowed to sell to the public and this is actually a little bit of a side twist here sorry but a lot of people say, oh, it's a smuggled animal. You're not allowed to get them from because the country of origin 
never export it, so it's illegal. Not always the case. And they're a prime example of that. Same with my red tail greens. They were legally sent to a zoo that is allowed to sell to the private sector. So these are legally obtained in the end. It's just getting new bloodline is really hard <laughs> due to that. Right. But it's kind of nice to be able to get them from a zoo because you know it's coming from a good source. It's not sketchy. It already has paperwork attached to it. And it, like you say, it was illegally obtained in the first place. So that's probably the best place you can get it from. Oh, exactly. So I try like every time those imports happen, I'm like, oh, the Russian people, it's like, give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, it's so great. But it really helps broaden the lineage. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So is there any other animals that are on your mental list, we can call it, that are similar to that original boega that, you, you know, you had on your wall? Like, is there any dream species that you want to bring in one day? Oh, gosh, you know what? There really isn't. You're happy with the machetes and the other projects you have on the go? I don't have that dream. I need it, like, feeling anymore. Like, I work with such a diversity, even if it's temporarily with the imports. I just, the fact I get to experience that is amazing. Um, I'm sure once I'm able to expand like my personal collection more, I'll probably start looking more into that. But currently, it's really just the machetes I really want to focus on and then the odd random pairs I have. Gotcha. Is there any species that you can think of that you think should be more of a staple in the hobby that isn't? Like, is there any, any that kind of almost fit the bill of being similar to like a ball python or a corn snake that we just for some reason isn't popular but probably could be? Oh, there's lots. Um, surprisingly, a lot of the European rat snakes I would find are really good for that because um, they're a lot more calmer than, say, like a corn snake's calm, but they're always go, go, go. They're moving all the time. And there's a lot of European snakes that are very calm and they're smaller than a corn snake, but not too small. And there's, I don't know, there's a lot. Um, that's one of them. Hmm. I'm trying to think what else. Strangely enough, there's a type of vine snake that eats fish and like the Asian vines, most of them are lizard eaters, but one of them is a fish eater and they're immensely easy to keep. A friend of mine has a group and she has hers breeding already and she's only had them for a year, but just, she has like a, a moving water feature and they just go fishing in it and oh, it's cool. that easy. Just have some live plants and sticks and stuff for them to climb and some water and they just from a branch, you just dive down and grab a fish, like spear fishing almost. That is cool. Like my first colubrid was actually an Asian vine snake. And being I was only 15 keeping them, I'm pretty sure most people could keep them. And they're highly visual animals. They're always out and about moving around. They're easy. This, to me, they're really, really easy if you get a healthy one anyway. Yeah, I feel like there's so many diurnal species of snakes that we could have in the hobby that we just don't. And everybody get you, we have so many nocturnal species that people don't necessarily see. So you end up having, a, you know, they're in their hides all day and you don't get to appreciate them. But there's so many amazing diurnal species that are active and would be, hang out in the trees that people could appreciate more. Yes, definitely. There's a lot more out there. It's just people don't know, right? They think, mm -hmm. oh, I've heard of this species, but I don't know people keeping them. They must be difficult. That's not the case. It's just underrated, I guess, is the word for that. Well, I am really excited about species diversity in the hobby, and I hope that continues to, to move. And I think you're doing some great work as far as that is concerned, especially with doing some of the captive breeding like you're doing. And I, I like your focus that you have. You, know, you have a, a species in mind that you want to add to the hobby, and you seem to be very good at going after that. So that's really great. Is there anything else that we haven't touched on today that you wanted to say or touch on? I think we covered most of it. Like my, my big thing with the imports are the ethic, I guess the ethic and morals behind it. And I just, I want to be that person, that importer that is not the typical importer. I want to do it for a reason and a positive reason, but like we've talked about that already. It's just, there's be a bit of a change in terms of the stigma of importers just being flippers. And that's the far opposite I would I ever want to be. There's times where I even lose money, but you know what? I don't care. I'm happily bringing them to the hobby. I'm helping somebody out and helping the animals out long term. Yeah, that's but before we wrap up, that's one thing I'll say is that I think reptile importers do have a stigma about them, right? And I'm sure you, that's something you've had to deal with, especially because the history of the hobby, the importers were pretty bad. If you go back to like the 80s, there's just like horrible things that importers are bringing in everything. And so you're you have that business and people's first inter in interpre or in interpretation of it might be negative, right? So that it, you kind of have a up uphill battle in some ways. 
Yeah, there's been a couple times with uh, this one particular person that he actually gets mad at me for not being the typical importer because, God forbid, like, I could kind of get it, but at the same time, it's like, dude, get over it a little bit. It was, I was touching his animals. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you want me to do? Leave it in a container and not inspect it and you get it where it might be, like, really sick or have a sore and then blame me? No, thank you. I'm going to be touching your animal. Inspect yeah hydrating it and he was so so upset about that and it's like well if you want to deal with the typical importer go with them yeah Not exactly <laughs> well i think it's obvious that you have the animal's interest at heart and that's your first priority so that's excellent can you let everybody know where they can find you more information about your business um yeah um facebook is definitely the easiest way oddly enough on my personal profile um ashley Dazan. But I do have a page, Northern Lights Reptile Imports. You could contact me there. I might be a little slow, but I'm there. And as well, same as a website, northernlightsreptileimports.com. Awesome. And as always, that will all be in the show notes for everybody. So Ashley, thank you so much. This was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed this. So thank you for stopping by. No problem at all. Thank you. All right. That is the end of that episode. Ashley, thank you so much for stopping by. I had a blast chatting with you. It was really interesting learning about the inner workings of the importation business. And I do really appreciate your general philosophy when it comes to importation. So thank you very much for sharing that. Listeners, thank you so much for listening. Ashley did post on Facebook a couple of days ago that she has tracked down a female machete snake. She was super excited and which is great. So it looks like that will be a project that she's going to be following up on. Hopefully in the next couple of years, I think she's going to have the snake in her collection by sometime in the spring. I'm not sure if it's, I think it's still a young snake. So it's probably still going to be some years before she has captive breeding taking place. But that was kind of an exciting announcement that I thought I would toss in through the outro. Again, if you are interested in supporting the podcast, make sure you head to patreon.com slash animals at home. And thank you very much to customreptilehabitats.com for sponsoring the podcast. If you are looking for any reptile equipment, make sure you head to the affiliate link in either the YouTube description or the show notes. And if you do make a purchase, a small commission will come back to me at no extra cost to you. All right, that is the end of that episode. If you are interested in learning who the next guest is, then you can definitely head to Patreon. That's where we're going to start sharing the new future guests and also giving you guys the opportunity to submit questions to the guests that are coming up. I will catch you guys in the next episode.